Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, we are thrilled to have uh, Calvin Abe with us. Uh, Calvin established Abe uh, Landscape Architects in 1987 with more than 30 years of professional experience in a wide range of landscape architecture and urban design projects. He is noted for his ability to transform conceptual design ideas into creative and artful built forms. Uh, Calvin is a fellow of the American Society of Landscape Architects and is also a registered landscape architect in California. He has degrees in, uh, from Harvard University and Masters of Landscape Architecture and a Bachelor's of Landscape Architecture from Cal Poly Pomona. Um, Calvin is also a uh, artist and uh, quite a great photographer and uh, um, he's, his medium is looking at the beauty and landscape in the world. He has an interesting title uh, to his, uh, his talk. It's called Mutualism, Sex Between City and Nature. And we are thrilled to have you here with us. Thank you very much.
So you're welcome to visit the website for others. Uh, but I'm going to talk about a particular issue that is relatively common to each project. So just to begin, uh, mutualism. It's a word that has stuck with me for many, many years. I've discovered it um, through some biologists who, who studied relationships between organisms. And I like to think of this as the context in which I view the world as a designer. And I use sometimes the uh, sex between city and nature only because it's a catchy phrase. But it is that idea, the relationship between city and nature, urban and human experience, that I'm mostly interested in. When we think about mutualism, if mutualistic, being mutualistic is taking multiple organisms that have relationship to each other and are beneficial to each other. So they're, they're not adversary, they're not, you know, they're not fighting, they benefit each other. This is a, an image of uh, an acacia, a southwest acacia, where the caterpillar, of course, is feeding on the flower. There's nothing wrong. With it. The ant is feeding on the nectar of the caterpillar, and also the ant is providing some safety, some safe harbor. And so each, each organism is related, has a relationship that is benefiting themselves, or at least being relatively neutral. Uh, this is an old movie. It's probably some of you <laughs> may remember this movie, Avatar. And when I saw this movie, uh, what, eight, ten years ago, I said, hey, Hollywood gets it. Do you remember? Uh, this was about uh, the Navi, the tribe, uh, where the digital, where the humanoid, and the na and nature were one. They were unified. They were symbiotically connected. And it wasn't until man showed up and disrupted that uh, imbalance. So that, in a sense, is the mutual, is a contextual narrative in which I think about projects. And that's really important. So let's talk about me just for a minute here. This is me at three years old. Uh, but it was that when I was when I turned four, that's when uh, I I don't remember the conversation, but I remember one incident. My brother was born. My younger brother was born at four. He replaced me. I remember sitting in the car watching my mother come out of the hospital with my dad in a wheelchair. He got into the car. My brother was sitting next to them, and they were looking at Ray, my brother. And I said, I just experienced that something is wrong here. I experienced that I was being, of course, today I, I language it like I was being replaced, I'm not the center of attention anymore, but I remember sitting back like this, pouting. And I share that because uh, it wasn't until I was about 25 or so, 30, and I realized I went going through life thinking, what is wrong here? What was wrong with me? What was wrong with the world? And as soon as I discovered that it wasn't anything wrong with me. <laughs> that, but I used that narrative, that I put that inquiry into my head. I started to think about the world. What's missing in the world? What, what do I need to, uh, what's missing in the world? What problem do I need to solve to make the world a better place? And so it transformed that little, that short narrative. I grew up on, I said grew up on a farm. This, I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm, I, when I drove here, this is, my farm is nothing compared to what I see here. It was a 40-acre strawberry farm uh, with about 10 acres of grapes. Um, this is critical in, my, in terms of how I think about nature and my connection to the earth. Maybe some of you who are landscape architects have a similar relationship. At night, uh, we had grape vineyards, and I can remember smelling nature. I remember smelling the earth, hearing the crickets, and then uh, I was fortunate enough to grow near, grow up near the American River. This is actually, I took these uh, last year. It's pretty much the way it was back, you know, 60 years ago. And it was in 1970 that I moved to LA, mid-1970. Mid so I was confronted by a whole different world. And I was confronted by a world that I wasn't used to. The context, of course, in this case, you know, at that time we used to have uh, air pollution. Uh, um, they call it, uh, 
alerts, air, where you didn't, you couldn't go outside to play. You had to stay inside. And the city was, you know, the city was a city. It was really harsh. Today, the city is still the same way. Okay, this is this was last year. I, I take airplanes up, or helicopters up, and photograph and document at least once or twice a year in Los Angeles. The only difference is the air quality. We don't have smog alerts. And that's kind of a myth of Los Angeles. Everybody thinks uh, LA still has smog alerts. The air is quite clean uh, because of technology, because of um, technology in both gasoline and, and of course, the motor, motor vehicles. But what's missing here, in my mind, is still of nature. Over the last century, 150 years, we've buried nature. We've made it into channels, we've made it into basically suburban growth and development. Uh, so this is the context in which I work in. Okay? You gotta, gotta get a sense, I should show more nasty pictures, where we define nature with a sign. Okay? You notice the graphics? Uh, there's an egret, whoops, right there. Uh, that defines the crossings for a lot of these bridges. So we're crossing the LA River. That paradigm is shifting, however. LA is, there's about a billion dollars of funding going into the transformation of not so much the river itself, but the edges, and that's a current. But today, this is what I consider our nature. It, it's drainage, uh, yeah. So when you think about um, my work, it's really about the relationship and the reconnection of city and nature. So I work in that environment, I come from this world, and I'm always looking for that relationship. Looking where, not only uh, looking for opportunities to create beauty, but also having nature be inserted into the city, such that it, it starts to become uh, a work more workable, sustainable city. I think that's the movement in our, our profession. That's where we will have the most impact, is where we can insert and create nature such that it will uh, become the infrastructure. It becomes the, uh, the structure of, of whether it's open space or green spaces. It's a system that we can adopt. And that's, as, as a profession, I see that across the country. So stepping back even up to a higher scale, um, in terms of contextualism, uh, what makes California California? Is it the Golden Gate Bridge? Is it these beautiful places, the Seventy Park? Is it Hollywood? Right, the mythology of Hollywood, which is really a myth. Or it's Venice Beach. I mean, these are kind of iconic images that I think we all have across the country. But the truth is, the reality is, what makes California and California is the water. It's the, it's the system. It's the series of dams and, and pumps and channels and, um, and so forth that makes California possible. And that's true whether it's northern San Francisco or Los Angeles. Well, Los Angeles, the history goes, I won't well known the history. Mulholland established the first waterway. Uh, from Owens, let's see here, this works. Up there, Owens, I'm going to share this because I, that's a project, the next project, the first project I'm going to show you is Owens Lake. So in 1900, you know, uh, the mayor, Evan, and Mulholland kind of, they did some nasty things. They, they went around and purchased, uh, under false pretenses, purchased the land in um, Owen Valley. Whoops, Owen Valley. I don't know why it looks dark, but basically it's, it's in that area. And within, uh, they, anyway, they first sold all the land, and they, and they built, within 10 years, they built a 200 mile aqueduct, basically it's pipe and drainage dam. And that led, and they did that because, they, not that they needed water at the time, but they moved a few, have you seen China, you gotta see uh, Chinatown, uh, that movie that tells you about the story of the politics of water, where they were draining reservoirs and making the point that we need water. But they saw a vision of the future uh, expansion of a population, and they couldn't do it without water. Today, um, I call two, two Californians, the have and have not. 
Generally speaking, the people who have the water are up here. People who don't have water, they're down here. And the majority of people, 60% of people, live <coughs> down here. Uh, the Central Valley, where it says Fresno, they also have uh, water, and they're the highest water use in California. Uh, so they're, they're in the 60s, they built this red line, which is called the State Water Project. And that fed, it was supported by all the developers and by the agricultural people. And 80% of the people in the north voted no. Everybody else, Southern California and the Central Valley in 1960, voted yes. And that's the reason why we have continued growth and expansion of the And this is a water network. I don't want to get into it, but just to say that you know, water in California is a finite resource. <coughs> Population is growing at leaps and bounds. We go from nearly 50, you know, we're going to have a lot of people. And water is going to be an issue. Conservation is going to be key. 80% uh, of the water use is in agriculture, so that's, that's you know, we're doing our share in the city. Um, there's a tremendous amount of conservation that is occurring. Compounding the problem, of course, is climate change. The melting of the uh, Arctic is pushing, changing the high pressure zone. That's why in the last 10 years we've had drought. There is a, there is a shift in the high pressure uh, zone that the scientists have determined. And so that's obviously going to be an ongoing issue, uh, resulting in uh, reduced snow caps. This is a series of um, uh, aerial um, um, maps, satellite maps, that show diminishing um, snow pack. Of course, when there's no water, we pump from the ground. And so the red indicates the depth of pumps that they're now having to drill. OK, the work. So, <laughs> You can see, the co again, the context in which uh, uh, the landscape architect practicing in Southern California, even in California, what, uh, what drives and what frames my perspective. I mean, it's totally different. It depends on where you are in the world. I've done projects around the world, China, Japan, Europe, uh, Middle East. Um, and the challenge I always find is trying to determine what is the context in which I'm working in. What is the, the social context, the economic context, the political context? I'm understanding that so that the design is appropriate. I did lots of projects in China that I don't think were appropriate because the language I couldn't quite communicate and understand the relationship, the kind of cultural relationships that I need to understand. So 10 years I, I gave up, I decided to just stay home. There's so much work to be done in our city. So that 10 years um, in Southern California, California work. So uh, again, these are a few large projects that are selected. Landscape as irony, the Owens Valley Dust Mitigation <coughs> Project. This is where, this is the lake that got dry because Mulholland tapped the lake to bring down to LA in, uh, about 100 years ago. Uh, this lake, um, no, the, the aqueduct feeds about 200,000 households. Okay, so about three people per household, roughly. So you get I get how much water. We were just 100 square miles. It's not a small lake. 19, no, year 2000, there was a lawsuit filed uh, because of this. The dust was carcinogenic. It's, it's, ar that ars it's arsenic, it's alkaline, it's mostly alkaline. And uh, I think it had more to do with, just from my readings, it had more to do with water. They used dust as, uh, a, as a basis for air quality, as a basis for stopping or having LA solve the problem of dust. And in, mit in the mitigation measure, they were required to reduce half of that water, so only 100,000 households are fed by this, by this uh, stream. And the rest of it is to remain here. About seven years into the making, um, the state land commission, who was controlling the mitigation process, the engineers were just dominating the whole. There's a billion dollars 
of mitigation measure, a billion dollars for this 100 square miles. Okay, that's what they projected ultimate cost would be. And the engineers were saying, uh, the state land commission said you could either shallow flood, gravel cover, or be, uh, vegetative cover. And so you can imagine square miles of gravel being covered, square miles of, of uh, vegetative cover. Uh, there were engineers and bio, restoration biologists working. One day, uh, after about seven years of implementing this, uh, somebody, at the state, I don't know who and how this came to be, the State Lands Commission said, why don't you hire a landscape architect? It doesn't look good out there, okay? It was an aesthetic decision. Why don't you hire a landscape architect? And so, I was fortunate enough to be, there were three firms. My, my firm, Nubis, and MLA Studios were the three firms. And we're each given a mile or two miles of landscape design to do. How do you design a square mile? I mean, I plan projects. You, plan, you know, if you're doing planning, regional planning, square miles is nothing. But when you're having to physically design, where do you start? Um, I might make a note that Nubis won a national award this year. If you look at uh, the ASA awards, they won for their visitors, kind of visitor point marker. Uh, our solution was much more modest, and you'll see what we did. But I asked a question about the staff. How do you design a square mile? Or you know, roughly a square mile. We had two, two, two miles, two different areas. I thought, oh God, I, I just misspelled zero apology, I think. Um, but I thought back to graduate school. I, I thought back to um, Doug Way, my professor who is a geomorphologist who maps surface geology to determine the nature of geology below. So I thought, why don't we map the watershed, the drainage patterns of the watershed? And so the Sierra Nevadas, which is a huge watershed for Poland Valley, it's a huge watershed. And so I had them map uh, the whole watershed, and you get these kind of patterns. In this case, it's dendritic. It tells us it's granite. And I already knew most of the Sierras are granite, but I had the staff go through that exercise. Because we're looking for a structure, a pattern, a language that would connect its, uh, our landscape to its region, as well as providing some dust control. So, you know, the staff play uh, wire, they did a bunch of stuff. Basically, it became a computer model, but I like the analog approach. These two uh, pictures represent one square mile. We had two parcels. Um, we had the most challenge, I, thought, I complained because we had the most challenge in sight. Uh, because we were in the lower half of the Golden Valley, and it's very heavy clay, and very little to be done to uh, mitigate that. But we looked at vegetation patterns, um, knowing that by diversifying the pattern, we would get better habitat. Um, we looked at vegetative patterns as in just graphics, but also from a wind, uh, wind standpoint, we noticed that whenever we had um, kind of this left pattern that would, dis that, that would deter the particles. Um, of course, in our scheme, we primarily planted it. Um, we did about a year's worth of testing what would grow in this heavy, saline, salty clay. I knew that by growing plants, we would get wildlife. And I thought, well, it's only a natural clover, um, there's endangered species. And I looked at, well, why don't we put a couple of bird lines? I, I, and think about, well, what is that shape? Can you make it into a sculptural element? And I went to the Mulholland pipe, the 10 foot down in the pipe as inspiration. Today, um, it was built a couple of years ago. This amount of vegetation, it's only two years. It's so challenged. Um, this is two years worth of growth. It's amazing that nothing really grows there. Um, but the bird lines are there. <laughs> and I think they're quite beautiful. I went, I, I've been there um, at, at daybreak. Um, you notice the irrigation heads? We have to irrigate in order to um, establish the plants. One square mile of irrigation. The water is all being recycled. It's being 
um, it's draining still ponds and you can see the pond beyond. The brick lines are potential pipe. Thinking of and thinking of uh, Nancy Holt's installation. Um, uh, it's called um, so, so solar right or so, um, I'm sorry. And so each each bird line is oriented to one was oriented to the summer solstice at sunrise, one was to Mount Whitney, and the other was to LA. I ordered organized it so that there would be some relates kind of a ge ge uh, geographic relationship. And this is in the middle of a half you have to drive about three quarters of a mile to get here. It's hard to find. It's for visitors. They opened it up to public. But I think it's it's a beautiful piece of sculpture. It's simple. It's relatively modest. And the next project is a different scale. It's an installation. It's something I did a number of years ago, but it relates to water. They call, in this case, context is the cultural narrative. A curator in downtown Aspen, a museum curator, asked me, well, what is the Lance, cultural land. What do people think about landscape? You're a landscape partner and you should be able to answer that. And um, I thought about it and I said, even in Southern California, it's very common here. Southern California, we're always down with the lawn. And because most of migration, and people who came to were from here, Midwest. East Coast and Midwest, or during the turn of the century, they, they came to LA because it was hot, sunny, and it was paradise. The idea of the, of the lawn is the, is really the, a kind of a, it's, it's the default. People have this desire for the green lawn. Of course, the lawn in America is the largest crop, irrigated crop. However, it takes 16 inches of water to keep grass green so in LA because of the back of transpiration rate. It only rains 12 inches. So where does the other huh, four feet come from? That's the, we, you know, people, things, the paradigm has shifted already. It's still a battle. Uh, so this installation a uh, few, several years ago was to discuss that narrative, that kind of default of what, what people, the public, define as beauty. This is, that was a plaza, it was actually a Noguchi plaza. And one day, uh, one evening, and I always dream, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a dreamer, and I'm a morning person, and I solve and think about ideas in the morning, and I dream, and I focus on my dream, and the older I got, I realized my dreams are, and I had this idea of, of the floating circle. As it turns out, the plaza has a defined, Noguchi put a defined circle in there. But, um, so we did this diagram. We talked about, um, there's a temporary month long installation. The blue line represents a, life's, a lifeline. And I used the gallery inside. So we laid 3,000 square feet of lawn on the plaza, transformed it into a park. Um, the rainbird pet, you know, that sound became competent, but also symbolized the amount of water it takes uh, it, to keep this green. So the, the green park became, um, obviously, it's kind of a beautiful park environment, but also became a picnic area. There was a golf course. Uh, people were putting out there. <laughs> people were having a great time. They were quite sad when I removed it uh, because it transformed. You know, the transformation of experience uh, from that harsh plaza. This plaza is really used for community events and so forth. So, uh, again, this is many years ago. Uh, I made 200 feet of blue carpet and ended up in a one cubic yard of compost. I had the city donate a compost pile that I put inside the gallery. And I, you know, I'm just, I remember overhearing the people at uh, the opening reception. What is that smell? And it was, it was I, I couldn't take this. I took it right the day after it was allowed to leave the compost because it's bacterial content. And so it had this uh, anaerobic uh, smell. And, um, and, I, and I thought, I have a happy smile on my face because that's nature. That's nature engaging in nature. 
within a gallery setting uh, that was quite, that was a lot of fun to discover. Um, this is a little tangent. It's, it's, it's not derived from um, water, but it's a special project to me. It's a, uh, it, it's, it deals with water from a drought tolerance or from a standpoint. There's a photo of it on poster. Um, I thought I would share this because, I, first of all, I love the project. Um, the site was an existing. So again, uh, LA, I'm dealing with existing. The, the city is built out. Um, and uh, I won't get into a long story, but, but basically, there's an architect designing the garden. It's failed. Um, because they were demoing and they stopped the demo after one day because it was affecting the surgical monitors upstairs. So the project went on hold for about a year and then about a year later they invited six landscape architects. It says, oh, landscape architects, they could create up things. Okay? And and I listened to them, they said, uh, they said, you can't remove the concrete, you know, you can put a few pots out here. Uh, HQA had $20 million for the improvements. That was the garden cost. And they stopped the whole project. So I came up with this idea. I thought, why don't we, I said, why don't we just think of it, the garden as epidermis, as a display of skin, as a metaphor to, to heal the skin. You basically in for it. So I, I said, we could just bring the garden, lay it down, and uh, fabricate everything off-site and crane it in. So there's minimize the vibration. We kept, and if you, we kept the concrete, existing concrete, that you'll see. Uh, I won't get into all the details of the garden, but there are four gardens. They were happy when they first put this budget because our garden was only 12 million. So they were saving I said, well, you could at least give me a couple of days, then. They didn't like that comment. But, uh, no, they, they paid. We were crying. Uh, we had, you know, like, uh, not 20, uh, uh, 12 different subconsultants, structural, mechanical, etc. But it's the uh, garden of community garden up, 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 up top, the garden of Wimsey, the blue garden. These are all healing gardens. And I won't get into the theory of healing unless you want me to if you have questions about it. Uh, but that was part of the premise, the pitch. Uh, so we literally fabricated, and I, this is a little bit more technical, I thought maybe sharing this. Um, we used, there's about a couple of thousand linear feet of stainless steel, three eighths that we used the entire country. We bought all the stainless steel in the country. Uh, at that time, it was out of the supply, and we used it all up. And it was fabricated in Las Vegas and shipped out here. This is very, very complicated. You can see it, the existing concrete. That's the existing deck. I did not touch it. And we floated the drainage. So the, actually the whole uh, uh, planter is floating. And I allow the water to float underneath. And there's about a half inch gap, air gap. Uh, because of the loads, this is above parking structure. We put styrofoam to lighten the load to get the height. Uh, we did lots of mock-ups. Um, a lot of parametric models, um, and did, obviously you could do this here. So you're, you're right there, uh, at, see, what do you call it? That machine? Yeah. Anyway, the fabricator took care of that. Uh, and then this is the EK wood. This was actually, all the wood was bought in Brazil. It's, it's a plantation tea. Shipped to Illinois to cut, it was dry, picked and dried there. Shipped to Illinois. Whether this is sustainable or not, this is what happened because of the cost factor. There's a million dollars of the wood bench here. Um, and then assembled in Las Vegas. Uh, it was one of the most complicated projects. The general contractor said this is more complicated than building a high rise. Every square inch in the garden was customized. Every, because every, there was no orthogonal, there was no. Uh, uh, and, and what we call the shape structure became the main part. Uh, it was shaped like a part, and we had Benjamin Ball, a local artist, helped us shape it and sculpt it. And today, it's 
I think, a beautiful moment. It's a transformational garden. The patients and staff, uh, they certainly love it. Um, but it was from that concrete deck to this, I think, it's, you know, healing has something to do with uh, blood pressure. It's about calmness, about meditation. We carry the serious space of that. For quite the users of the conference room, the doctors use it in the conference room. And some of the details. It's, I'm always amazed that we were able to do this. Uh, I don't tell the client that. I told them I knew exactly what we were going to do. <laughs> but it was quite a challenge build this um, existing structure without touching it. Uh, the series of gardens, the using the wind and, and the colors, uh, even the water features were very clinical. We had to, they had to be at arms uh, lengths away because of bacterial content. They were concerned about people touching water. They wanted water. This is the blue garden, so they had educational garden. So going back to a, this is, I think it's third project. Going back to an installation. So I'm interested in installation because it's it's a contextual way of thinking about an idea and being able to implement it. So that site has less to do with the idea that I can explore an idea. In this case, Ojama was about uh, having nature interrupt the experience, the human experience within an urban environment. Ojama means, it's a Japanese uh, interruption. And my grandmother used to, say, used to tell me, Ojama oh, Naru, uh, you're getting in the way. And I remember that since I was always getting in the way of my grandmother because I was always hanging around. And, and so, because we have so many fires in uh, Southern California, we use, obviously, straw bottles as erosion control, sediment control. <coughs> And that material fascinated me, and I researched it. It turns out this material comes from my hometown of Sacramento. It actually, Sacramento is surrounded, uh, surrounded by uh, rice, rice. And so the straw bottles are rice hulls. And it turns out also that the Japanese have been doing this for centuries. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, used typically for Shinto shrines. You see this. It's very common, right? You can tell it's Japanese. And uh, it's a very sacred material. And the wonderful thing is, it smells wonderful. So I said, what are we going to do with it? I bought 100 of these 30-foot uh, strands. They're 9 foot down, 100 of them. And I said, let's think about it. And I thought, oh, it's, it's about, uh, it's a Buddhist precept called duality, or yin yang, that you weave two things together and become you know, become unified. And I thought, why don't we just leave it and figure out, maybe we can stack it. So it became an interruption. In this case, it was lining up with City Hall. We moved it around every week. It was up for about uh, 90 days. It became uh, something that they get the people engaged with and passed through. And I moved it to line with a uh, community center up and on. This is actually, no, this is the north-south axis of the plaza. So it became an engagement. People smell, it smells like rice. As well, it became a habitat for local pigeons. Um, again, this is a kind of contextual project, conceptual project, where I was interested in having nature being an interruption in the urban environment. How do we introduce nature back into the world? Uh, Burbank Water and Power Eco Campus is about water, primarily about water. And there's an interesting story. Uh, it's an abandoned power plant, Napa Park. The infrastructure um, um, changed um, from, well, it, it became obsolete, so they could take down the structure. And I was, I've been doing a lot of work for the power plant, basically planting it. And um, one day, um, Rick calls me. He's the director there. So tell him we want to make a open this thing up. We're ripping everything out so you can design a beautiful garden. And I, that was this is a beautiful boardroom. I said stop. He literally said stop. 
do not, so we walk down there. You know, this is being yelled. We walk down there and say, I could use every one of these. You remember, well, I grew up in the era of, um, you know, uh, Gasworks Park in Seattle. Um, uh, Highline was just first phase of being completed. And I thought, here's an opportunity Transform, transforming and connecting its history and creating um, something more than um, some connection to obviously its path, but transforming it to a new place, a new sense of place. And I'll talk just briefly. So the transformation occurred, it's still growing. <coughs> this is actually a couple of years old. The mind basically captivated the entire structure there and becomes a great hangout for employees, staff, uh, basic city workers. You start to see some of the artifacts that we maintain. We rebuilt some of the structure because this is already being dismantled. We reassembled it just to um, make it a little, a little bit more authentic. This channel here, I can call the fire radiation channel. Now it's actually an eight foot deep utility bolt. They were about ready to rip this thing out. And I said, that's a perfect capture device. 100% of the stormwater in Southern California meant we collect water. We have 100% of the site flows into this remediation tub. I just said, let's put some holes through the bottom of it. We filled it with gravel and planted it. It became an important mine, important artifact, so to speak. But it became a functional uh, a functional element as well. Uh, this, I think, is a unique project. It's, it was a uh, site certified. We call it, right. It's one, it, it was a pilot project um, during the first early stages, and it was a uh, site. It's the first industrial site actually that was approved. I love it because we 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 saved all. You know, again, this is something from LA. All water was perked. That's not always possible in Hell because it's Soils, but the soil in this area is quite permeable. Um, we did a green work too. It's, it's colorful. But okay, the Fulmer Project, I call the Urban Filter. Because of that Burbank Water and Power Project, the city said, hey, we have this park. We have a million dollars, and maybe you can fix it up. This is Parks and Recreation site. So they were interested in like redoing the lawn, redoing the, light, the lighting. Uh, we walked to the site, and this is what I found. A little Pahanga wash. It's actually an old creek. It's all concrete. And it drains to the LA River. So the watershed, I said, there's something here, okay? They only had a million dollars. But I researched it, I, we realized that the watershed was quite substantial. And um, we made a proposal that to turn the park, rather than recreation, it become a filtration, water clean cleaning system, riparian zone. Unfortunately, it was about $6 million the estimate came in. And so the project was delayed for two years. And they went, there was an example of, we were an advocate of water. We're an advocate for transforming, bringing nature back into the city. And so, uh, it took a couple of years to fundraise through grants, water grants. They went from park recreation, park recreation money, they went to the water quality money. And there's actually lots of money for projects like this. And this is unique because there are very few open spaces and um, even channels that you can convert. There's, there's so engineered. Um, uh, the rendering of the concept today, oh, during construction, this is, this is a flood. This is what. So uh, it, it damaged some of our check dams, but it was repairable. We got the planting in, stabilize it, and today it's a creek. Now, I, said, I think for practicing landscape architecture, this is probably nothing. Right? This is what you do, I, I have to assume. When, you're, when you have a natural system, but when you're in LA, where there is no natural system available, we have to make it, we have to push really hard. 
and the funding is really tight. So we've got both the recreational improvements at the parks and recreation, but also the water quality. And it's growing, it's incredible, the Aurora Willows. And we, of course, did the interpretive signage, or an important part of the narrative for the public to see. Um, okay, just, what are we doing on time? There's a couple of minutes of film. Joe mentioned, just indicated, um, my firm does film. And Evan Mather, my partner, is a filmmaker. He's, if you just type in Evan Mather, Dot com, I don't know, he's, you'll see his film. He's, he's well known. He shows around the world at different film shows. Uh, but we use, I said one day, why don't we use your, your knowledge and experience of film? And I asked him to do a little clip. So this is not a, this is film clips. Um, and, by the way, I bought, I brought some, anybody use DVDs still? Okay. So I have about, I don't know, 20 of these. This is uh, this one the National Communication Award, ASLA Communication Award a few years ago. Um, I still have about 200 of these, so I said, let me at least bring 20 because this is, you know, we gave at least two or 300 of them away. Uh, but I think we ordered 1,000 of them, or 500, I forget. Uh, so please, uh, it's a cool video, and you'll see a segment of it. We use film for educational purposes on projects, for interpretive purposes. Oops. Step would be to use the seemingly new construction material to create this is, beauty in a this public is space. This is the sh I did three years of shredding in my office to determine how much the process was expanded as we gathered and shredded three months of our table. How many trees? How much energy? There's a way of exploring an idea about if we call ourselves sustainable, how sustainable are we in practice? And I was looking for an art project, a way of exploring that idea of us. The shreddings were stuffed into cages of wire mesh, creating columns of paper. Abstracted trees that when clustered together in a gallery space would form a reconstructed forest. Everybody wear these masks. Dust, paper dust is toxic. Uh, we, uh, there's a gallery owner who let us uh, install. These are 25 of these. This is actually on our 25th anniversary. That's why we did 25 trees. As ever greater demands are being put uh, on our water and power okay, resources due to urbanization and website. increasing population growth, groundwater uh, aquifers water. are being depleted. Urban runoff is discharged into the Pacific Ocean, and 20% of our electricity is used to pump water long distances from northern to southern California. This is a exploratory inquiry about the, tr the country's landscape. We drove cross country doing time lapse. To, to, so in 30 minutes, you could see the entire landscape of the country, the geologic, the changes in, in uh, geographically from obviously from Atlantic to the Pacific. Um, it was shown all over the world at various film festivals. We're only going to see it in a few seconds of it here. With iPads, two iPads alternating. Evan had this idea of doing something locally in L.A. 
and we did a short transect. Speed. 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 What about the water? 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 What about the this is a short clip of Evan flying over. Um, By reading the landscape, one can learn a great deal about a place. This is the island of Panton Le Faux, in Lake Erie, near the U.S. Canadian border. Given that the label of the lake is written in French, we can assume we are in Canadian waters. In fact, the island was devastated by naval bombardments during the War of 1812 as American forces sought to capture the strategic location near Detroit. Today, the town of Panton is one of the most heavily populated in southern Ontario. The island sits near the 42nd parallel. This is the same latitude as Providence, Vladivostok, Almaty, and Rome. Panton Le is patterned in an east-west... At the interface of land and water that address the most urgent risks and greatest threats. Our design strategies will be landscape-driven, easily implementable, derived from observation, engagement, testing, and adjustments. Our team is uniquely qualified to quickly generate multiple strategies that can be tested and refined based on our skills, backgrounds, and experience. We are committed to listening and engaging with the stories and deep knowledge of community members, elected officials, government and business representatives, and local experts. Okay. Just a, a final. Evan just bought a drone and he took this up to show a reservoir. One of our reservoirs that are, that's dry. This is the Hollywood. I think it's the Hollywood. So that's a few segments of, uh, of our, film ex our film exploration. This is the last project. Um, although it's now on our s website, you're the first people to ex will see these images. And it's a recent project. Um, I, won't, I went out to photograph it with another photographer. We spent three days photographing this project. It's something that is... Um, near and dear to me because um, I had such a great client relationship. Uh, it was built, a, it's a charter school for the Wonderful Company. The Wonderful Company is the largest farmer, ir irrigation farmer in the country. They're not farmers though. They live in Beverly Hills. Uh, they own 200,000 acres of orchards, and pistachios, almonds, uh, they own Fiji Water, they own a lot of different things. They're about a $5 billion company. You know, their name is in LA, they are in museums, they're in hospitals, they don't, you know, $25, $50 million, and, you know, it's nothing to them. I said, wow. Uh, but they stopped doing that because they were so involved with the communities in the Central Valley, the farm workers, they decided to start building community facilities uh, because of this, to serve their needs, the farm workers, very poor, and they decided to build a school, a K through high school, charter school that they would run. And the idea was to advance agriculture and, and to merge agriculture and technology because they're looking for something, they're looking for efficiencies. They thought by teaching kids early about how to improve agricultural technology that would better themselves in the future. And they, would be, they wouldn't have to go to the fields. They would be part of the growth and development of that arena. And so they built this school for that purpose. And so my premise of the site, and this, is this, this was before the orchard. It's an alkaline desert south uh, of 
Fresno. This is what we're building, um, almond orchards, and it's, it's a desert, okay? Uh, it only gets about six inches of rain at the most. Today it's this. There are hundreds of square miles of this. Um, and these are almond, almond orchards, which I think are beautiful. I, I, again, I'm from LA, lived, grew up in Sacramento. I was driving up and down north and south throughout my whole life. And we used that, uh, I was looking for a strategy for how do you, how do you create a campus, a ground plane? Um, and we, we, I thought, well, why don't we take the aerial um, and through a parametric using grasshopper, what, do any of you use grasshopper? We use grasshopper and uh, developed the, you know, the algorithm and created a pattern. And that, so the values, the size of circles related to the values of the map. Uh, I can do it myself. I, have, <laughs> I mean, if people like you doing the technology. But I thought, how do we create that relationship between land and digital, land and technology? Just similar to what the school is trying to do with um, farming and technology. I wanted to create a site that started with an analog and converted it to digital. And what would happen to a site? So we studied, uh, we overlaid and mapped that, that system on the ground plane. Um, the other idea, educational succession, was a part of that. You know, the growth and development of, of children uh, from, in, I call informal play to formal play. And so there's a whole system of Informal, informal spaces to the more formal spaces, very much like succession uh, in college. A site plan I won't dwell on a lot. Um, and I'll go to, we took the drone up, and I'm always fascinated by the, the, the aerial looks just like the, <laughs> the diagram. The diagram got built. And the premise here is is that I wanted a relationship between, uh, of course, the, the campus itself that had the digital field to it, the field, uh, but the perimeter, I wanted it to be related to the surrounding, its context. So I deviated, you know, normally the fields, obviously the fields are always orthogonal. And I introduced this idea of the merge between a pattern, between nature and agriculture. And I, we, uh, I wanted to make sure that the landscape did not take more than eight inches of water. So fields and patterns were created. You can start to see the relationship between the two. I'm not mimicking it, I'm interpreting it. This, is, this, this wraps around the entire campus. And of course you can call it decoration, but there's a identity that was created, the campus identity. Um, you can see the perforated uh, security fences that we were all part of that digital. Um, we even introduced to Puntia. Puntia is a research product. Zero irrigation, grows no irrigation, no extra irrigation necessary. But Puntia is an edible plant. Uh, Cal State uh, Fresno is researching that material. We're looking for products that will use zero water. Uh, the orchards of our of olive, I did all this because, because Mrs. Resnick loved olives. Um, these are 100 year old olives, 80 year old olives. And you start to see the, the digital layer, both at the ground plane and also on the roof plane, creating shade, amphitheater, gathering pictures, the high school quad. And the pattern actually. I think it was relatively successful that it recalls the kind of digital nature of, uh, of this place. Other details. Phase two, um, the informal starts to show up in the middle school. The dining trellis, which will, how, which will hold about 200 kids at lunch hour. And the paving pa the patterns, again, recall uh, the possible technology that occurs here. A 
Okay. So, I ask the question, where do we go from here? The city. It's actually net zero water. You know, everybody's exploring net zero energy. I mean, the architects, we're, um, we're working on lots of net zero energy. But in Southern California, is it even possible net zero water? Well, we're inquiring into that problem. Um, uh, we're, we're commissioned this uh, 120 acre park that we're commissioned by the, by the county. I'm not going to, there's no, it's working drawings, I'm not going to even talk about it much, other than the fact that this explores net zero water for the first time. What we're doing is, um, I discovered, this is an early concept that there's a drain, storm drain line here. That, this, uh, this watershed is about two or three square miles, and there's water flowing in here, in this under. I said, you know, the county's worried about water quality. What happens if we cap that stormwater and brought it to the site? We had, our budget was uh, $50 million to do the site. We had an architect do the, he got 13 of the 50. I gave him 13. He wanted more, but he, he, the county wanted the community center, so uh, he's under our contract, so I was able to control a little bit of that. But they, we sold them on the idea of uh, net zero water, the budget. The $50 million reduced the amount of park and went into infrastructure. So this is the, this is the quandary, the dilemma uh, that we face. It's a, still a beautiful park, but, um, and we are doing capturing the water, pumping it to a filtering system, and so the whole site, the 120 acres, will, will not consume any potable water. But um, the engineer ended up getting uh, another 25, 25 million of that 50, just to do this. And I thought that was more important than, and then the supervisor, the county supervisor agreed that that was a more important prototype. This is what we call it, you know, I call it the what's next. We have to be, in Southern California, we have to be doing net zero water at some point, at least. Um, but there is, a, the point is, part of the point is it's costing. Uh, the, we're doing a lot of uh, wetland habitat vegetation between the water, all the perimeter is all wetland, all the water being pumped and filtered through the biological means all things that you know, we do as landscape architects. And, uh, but that result, I lost all the, the fun, and but the point of making uh, the city better, I think, has more importance. So this thing closing, I want to share my farm. I grew up on a strawberry farm, and for the last five years, uh, I've been growing strawberries in my front yard. Uh, sunset, picked it up, and they paint. Uh, he's a landscape architect, he grew up on a strawberry farm, that sounds like an interesting story. So I spent two days with a photographer shooting this front yard. And they invested two days with the photography time, uh, as well as one half a day with a writer. And uh, it was a fun exploration. I do, the, this changes out every five years, I do something else. So. Uh, prior garden, actually, I, I capture all the roof water, most, nearly zero, first three quarter inch of water is captured and stays on my house site. Um, and this is what I do with strawberries. I make 30 pints of strawberries every year and jam, pints of jam, and I give them away to my friends, neighbors, and family. And that's it. Thank you. So these are a couple, uh, a website. Check out Abe Lab. Uh, we've been doing a blog for three years every day, um, written by the staff, and we have a, a full-time editor who helps us. And I'm a photographer, so check out my, although be careful, you have to, there's a little editing on the photography, because <laughs> I do a lot of different photography, fine art photography, so. But please, okay. come up and whatever. Uh, maybe we have a, just a couple questions. Time for a couple questions.
Thank you for that. That was wonderful. Uh, where'd your net zero water idea come from? I mean, I know water's a big problem in California, yeah. but I've never heard that before. Yeah, th it is a it is a um, in the environmental community. It is a conversation um, by um, Dr. Gold, who's part of uh, used to be part of um, Heal the Bay, but there's a conversation to start dealing with. Um, water because of the energy use. I didn't mention this, you know, 20% of the state's energy, which correlates to carbon, is being used by the state to generate pump water from Northern California to Southern California. Again, 80% of the water is being used by the agricultural industry, but 20% is, you know, is by us. So, um, that, I don't know where it originated, but it's definitely a community conversation that we're all having. And, um, and we're, and again, that project was just ex exploration of where, how we're gonna try to, because there's not enough water, rainwater, to capture and reuse. There's, we're doing that also, but it doesn't quite uh, net out to zero. Yeah, I have a question up here. Um, so I know in Denver they have a lot of water laws where you can't capture that. So do you, you think is that in Denver, Colorado, yes. they have a lot of uh, water laws where you can't even capture your own um, rainwater in your houses. Do you think that's going to be um, something that maybe net zero water would come in in the future and change yes. that? Yes. Well, for L L.A., it's actually, it's not only L.A., it's actually a threat um, because of the Water Act, the Water Quality Act, federal, and the state uh, mandating, the water quality boards are mandating water quality, um, but it's capture, reuse, and capture and reuse. So in LA, the water, local water board is mandating by, by, uh, by state permit, mandating that we, we, do, we, we do capture and reuse. So there is no restriction because biological means are the most efficient ways of cleaning water, removing toxins. So, Malcolm. So, so there's there's a blog and there's film and there's photography yeah. and um, I get the blog every day. I didn't know I was oh. going to get it every day, but it arrives on my yeah. screen every day, and and it seems like a real California thing uh -huh. uh, in some respects. And I hope it's not too too nosy to say is all of this must be good for business in terms of what you do. Um, in terms of the blog or? Well, there's just a whole realm of things that's very, of things? very different than what you would expect a, yeah. a traditional um, office practice would be up to. I, is it good for business? I don't know that. For me, it's, uh, you know, uh, my, um, my heart is is of an artist, and I'm more interested in in the ideas and explorations, and so that's why film has emerged in the office. That's why art installations are important narrative in the office. That's why the blog is a way of self-expression. So the blog is not uh, narrated; it's it's fully self-narrated. People just write what they want, which may I think we're going to change. But for the last three years, staff. They want to write about their walk down the street and their experience. It's, it has to be relative to landscape architecture. It's about self-expression in my mind. So whether, whether it translates into dollars and cents, I could probably do that, but I've never been interested in dollars and cents. So maybe that's why, I don't know, I'm still working. <laughs> We have one more question back here. Hi. Uh, oh, that's really loud. <laughs> Sorry. Wait. OK, there we go. Um, I just really want to say that all the projects are super awesome. And just like sitting back here, make, like just seeing the images, I really want to become a landscape architect now. Just because they look so awesome and just like the scale and like the impact that it has on like the people that it's being made for. And one of my favorites was the ecology, community, and education. Yes. The uh, campus. campus. Yeah. 
And so I don't know if you touched on this, but I was just thinking, like, how did you consider, like, the opinions and the experience of, like, the kids who would be going there? Because, like, obviously you have clients, like, maybe, like, the school district or whatever, but, like, what about for the kids? Yeah. Well, that, they, we didn't have direct access to the children, uh, but we worked with the faculty. Uh, and we didn't really get into details of various spaces and learning uh, environment, outdoor learning environments. Um, Delano is a very harsh, hot environment. It gets up to 110, 115 degrees. So summer months uh, are really, maybe, they're actually going year-round school there. So, but um, most of the program at the space occurred between the faculty and us. And the students were not involved. Let's see. Um, I was going to say, oh, does anybody, my last name is spelled A-B-E, right? Abe. But the firm is A-H-B-E. That's a trivia question. I was forgot that. <laughs> 20 years ago, I said to the graphic designer, you know, for 40 years I've been correcting people. Maybe it's less calm, I'm a little more calm. Correcting people. And then they came back with a proposal. Um, it was a logo at one point. It became a corporate name. It's now transformed to an acronym. A healthy, beautiful environment. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, and unless you have any questions, I'm, I'm around. Well, he'll be around. So join me again in, in thinking. Kavanaugh.